senior class officers are now going to present the class gift, and Whitney Duran is going to do that as the president. Senior class president. What a pleasure it has been this year to serve my class and the school. The school has been such a blessing to me from the day I stepped into it. All the great memories and the friendships molded to last a lifetime. The discipline the teachers have given each student and the love and support of Dr. Miracle and Mr. Edmonds. I'm very pleased with what an incredible year we have had. Um, as I think back to all the memories of this year, as Dr. Miracle said before, you know, we had the lights outbreak, then the tornado, and also, you know, those uh, snow days. So, wow, what a year it's been here. Um, we've definitely ended this year with, ended this century with a boom. Um, now to the juniors, I want to wish you luck and a fantastic senior year. Before you know it, you'll be sitting right here in these seats saying your goodbyes. Never take the time you have here at Cincinnati Hills for granted. You'll never know when, how fast it'll fly by. It will hopefully be your most memorable year of all. Now I'd like to thank parents, teachers, administrators, and friends for all you've done for our class. And at this time, I would like to present you with this check to go towards a trophy case as our gift on behalf of the senior class the class of 1999. The school has given so much to our class, and now it is time that the class of 1999 gives something back. Thank you. Now don't forget your sunscreen. <laughs> Everybody's searching for answers Everybody tries to find some meaning in their lives Where do we belong? Who will be our shelter? Looking for salvation
accomplished and uh, the things that they're planning to do in the future. And um, <laughs> I have to be honest, I get nervous when I stand up here and talk. My position doesn't allow me a lot of opportunities to speak in front of large groups. And a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking to the senior class, and we were uh, nominating class agents and uh, talking about their role and uh, doing their five-year uh, pledge the annual giving campaign and one of the girls was seated in the front and I saw her bend to the girl next to her and she said she's nervous <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> you're right I am nervous so. but as members of the class of 1999 you have reached the um, end of your time here as students at Cincinnati Hills and you've made many friends and together you share 
many memories. The emotion of saying farewell fills each one of us. But for me, I feel somewhat fortunate. I'm not saying goodbye to you. I'm saying hello and welcome to the Eagle Alumni Society. My relationship with each of you is just beginning. And one of the things that I have enjoyed most about this past year is the opportunity to develop a uh, more personal relationship with our alumni. They are a true joy and a delight. And today, you will join the 153 other CHCA graduates as a member of the Alumni Society. We will work to keep you connected to Cincinnati Hills. Um, we will, of course, be praying for you while you're away. And we will work hard to keep you informed about our school as well as about one another. While you're at college, you will receive the Eagle's Eye. You'll also get emails from me. I love to come in early in the morning and type messages to the students. And uh, I found that that is a, a good way to connect with each of you. Occasionally, I'll pick up the telephone and wake you up early in the morning and before class, before you're ready, and just chat with what you're doing. Uh, find out if you've uh, found some Christian friends, if you found a church to worship in. And I really enjoy the opportunity to do that. And I trust that you'll want to stay in touch with us as well. Today, when you leave the theater, we would like to invite you, as well as your family and friends that are here, to join us in a reception in your honor. We also have a small gift for you and your official school passport. As you know, a passport gives you license to travel anywhere, but it's also a constant reminder that wherever you are, wherever you go, we here at home will be praying for you, will be encouraging you in your studies and in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In closing, I would like to thank each of you for the contribution that you have made to Cincinnati Hills and let you know that your presence on campus will be missed. On behalf of all CHCA graduates, I would like to congratulate you and welcome you as the newest members to the Eagle Alumni Society. May God go with you and may you continue to richly bless the lives of others just as you have so richly blessed ours.
please bow your heads and pray with me as we begin. God, we thank you for this opportunity that you've provided for us to one last time gather as a school community to worship, to sing, to pray, to share, reminisce. And Lord, now we pray that through these words that we can hear you. Lord, guide me as I speak that your words are heard through me. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Welcome to administration, faculty, parents, students, and most importantly, class of 1999. The service is called De Aspire, which as Dr. Belzano mentioned means scattering. The scattering of our students to colleges and universities, cities, towns across the country. This message in some ways is like that last bit of advice your mom shouts out to you as you're going out on Saturday night and says the same kind of thing you hear over and over. Uh, things like drive carefully, be safe, be good, it's going to be cold, grab a jacket, all those kinds of things that you really don't listen to because you're already thinking of all the fun you're going to have. So you yell something back like, yeah, I know, but you're really not listening. Um, as I say this, I know that mentally probably most of you are somewhere on the Carolina beach. Uh, but teachers like parents have to try, so here goes. I am particularly honored to have this opportunity to speak to you uh, since I've actually only had the chance to have about three of you in class. Uh, but if those three are any indication, you are a great class, which should be very proud of yourselves. I want to begin by reading you a story today, a famous story, a very powerful story, which comes from Genesis chapter 4. I want to read to you uh, verses 1 through 16. Now the man knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother, Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought forth the first wings of his flock, the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will, not, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking, crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, and you will master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Abel, Where's your brother Abel? He said to Cain, Where's your brother Abel? And he said, I do not know. I'm my brother's keeper. And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened up its mouth to see you re receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a sign or a mark on Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, the east of Eden. This might seem like a strange passage to pick for an occasion such as this. But actually, my remarks all stem from a conversation I had and some insights uh, from my colleague, Mr. Wagner, and your classmate, Brian Smith. Mr. Wagner was telling me about a research paper that Brian wrote on John Steinbeck's East of Eden. The discussion led directly and indirectly to my remarks today. So anything that I say that is of value comes from Mr. Wagner's insights and Brian's insights. All the meaningless, superfluous stuff is probably mine. Steinbeck's novel, in many ways, is an expansion of this Cain and Abel story. It's about the struggle with feelings of rejection, with sin, and most importantly, with the struggle of knowing evil yet still trying to do good. In East of Eden, like in Genesis 4, we find a very moving story. And I think it's moving because, as one of the main characters, Lee, says, people are interested only in themselves. If a story is not about the hearer, he will not listen. And here I make a rule. A great and lasting story is about everyone, or it will not last. It's strange and foreign, it's not interesting. 
only the deeply personal and familiar. And in some ways, we can relate to this story. It's the classic sibling rivalry. This is not a new motif in the ancient Near East. We have the Sumerian flood story with the birth of Anurta. We have the Egyptian story of the two brothers. And even, and here some of my colleagues might debate, but I think the story of the descent of Ishtar with the famous Queen of Heaven and her descent to the netherworld and how she trades places with her brother, sometimes lover, Tammuz. But this story is more than any of those. In Genesis 4, we have a situation that takes place outside the Garden of Eden, where humans now know good and evil. We'll come back to that point later on. Cain is angry because his offering has been rejected. He doesn't know why. He's frustrated. He plots against his brother. And here we get the speech that I think is the most important part of this story. God says, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. You, Kimshal, Hebrew word, where it means to overcome, rule. Your classmate, Brian Eslick, could parse this out for you perfectly. If they call him perfect, second masculine singular. But the problem is, how do you translate it? This is the crux of the whole Steinbeck novel. He looks at this word and gives suggestions. First, does it mean you will overcome it? Virtual done deal. The fate's decided. Nothing to worry about. Or is it a command? Thou shalt overcome it. Lee, the main character, one of the main characters, decides that it's something a little different. It's sin is crouching at the door. You may overcome it, acknowledging the power of human choice. I personally prefer the final reading, but I think I hear a little bit more urgency in the divine tone, almost a pleading, like a parent. Sin is crouching at the door. You must overcome it. As we leave the Garden of Eden, we have a great change. Because in the Garden of Eden, if you remember, there weren't many moral choices or dilemmas. We basically had one thing. There's a tree. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. But that falls by the wayside. And once we leave the Garden, we have new knowledge of good and evil, of all things maybe even. Now we enter into a world that is full of wonderful but difficult moral choices. Let me here make a rather forced parallel. As a CHCA student, living with parents, your likes were rather edemic, even-like. Now, I do not mean by saying that, but at 7.50 every morning, paradise began. <laughs> Dr. Miracle smiled and hugged notwithstanding. But to a certain extent, your parents and your school made many choices for you. Some because we think they're the right things to do, Others because they teach discipline and foster order. But now, as you're scattered from this place, you must begin making those decisions. You may leave this school and make some of the decisions that we made for you before. From now on, you may wear nothing but short shorts and camouflage sleeveless shirts. <laughs> you must bear the consequences for this. We no, no longer have anything to do with it. On a more serious note, your freshman year, or whenever you came to the school, you were all in the environments. In freshman Bible class, you were required to read it, and you were graded on that to see if you read it or not. But now, the choice is yours. Do you read it again? In your sophomore class, you heard about church history. You were required for a project to visit different churches and communities of faith. Once a week, you were compelled to attend chapel services. But now you must choose. Will you become part of a community of faith? To graduate from this school, you all need to have 120-some hours of community service. Now that you choose, will you give up your time and your goods for others? In a world um, driven by the sins of pride and greed, selfishness and the pursuit of power, will you choose to overcome them? God, like a parent, pleads with us. Months. The rabbi said that there is within everyone two urges. There's the Yetzir Tov and the Yetzir Ra. The good inclination and the bad, or the evil inclination. Of course, we are always supposed to follow that good inclination. The problem is that that's not always the case. And as you go from here, and excuse my pessimism, you will make bad choices. You won't always make bad choices, I hope. But 
we've been to college, we know students make bad choices. Parents know parents make bad choices. Christian studies teachers know Christian studies teachers make some bad choices. But this passage presents hope. While Cain's sin carries severe consequences, he's to wander the earth away from his family in this nomadic lifestyle. He does get another chance. He can make more choices. A few years ago, there was a Bill Moyer special in the book of Genesis, where he dealt with different passages of this book. And he discussed it, he was really a moderator with others, as they discussed different passages. And when they read Genesis chapter 4, he asked them, who would you rather be, Cain or Abel? One of the respondents fired back, Cain. Moyer responds, but Cain's the bad guy, Abel's the hero. Person came back with something I think is interesting. Well, the hero's gone, but the bad guy gets a second chance. And we hear what Cain makes of his second chance. If we read further on in this story, we hear about how he becomes a great culture hero from which metalworking and music come. He has a chance to make more choices after his failures, and he makes good ones. This is the story of a second chance of possibility. The book of Genesis, the whole Hebrew Bible, Christianity, I think each and every one of our lives are the stories of the God of second chances. And the second chances and possibilities. The possibility that next time we will overcome it. We must.
blessing and a closing prayer for our Savior's peace. Holy and gracious Father, thank you for an incredible opportunity to come alongside and work with these seniors all year and to watch them as they have um, embarked on special journeys. And I thank you for the, the honor that it's been to be there with them as they've made important decisions. And I pray, Lord, that you would go before them now to the college where they will be attending and prepare a place there that is safe and um, a place of, of haven and of rest. And that you would surround your angels around them and give them um, true strength and courage as they make this move to uh, this next phase in their life. Thank you, Father, for giving us them, and we pray that we would be confident in giving them back as they, uh, as they travel onward. I thank you for the families that have come and who have supported them along, along the way, and for the families who have traveled thousands and thousands of miles today to be with their sons and daughters who want to um, celebrate them. Thank you again for this day, and we pray a special blessing upon each and every one of the seniors. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming and don't forget to have refreshments for your distance.